interesting, right? And the um, it's not that we have low resolution mapping as much as we have low resolution models um, based on satellite altimetry and occasionally single beam mixed in there, maybe some magnetics. So seeing the real shape of the feature is always of interest. Um, I can't think of anything in particular that like is shocking or surprising. Most, you know, even the seamounts have interesting forms, but we've seen similar forms elsewhere before. I don't know, I was really excited by that donut. The donuts are cool. Um, we've seen them, we've seen really cool, um, I don't know, like pancake-like features on the side of the seamounts. Um, so they're not surprising, but they're still very, very interesting and um, not necessarily always easily explained. I've learned too from listening to the the geos talk about it who think about it a lot. They're, they don't have a ready answer. So I guess that's that's fun and interesting. Yeah, so the question for dive leader Megan, how are dive locations chosen? All right, well, how are they chosen? Um, well, it depends on what you're looking to do on the seamount. So our goal for this dive is to transit from a deep location to the summit of the seamount. Uh, and that will help us characterize the community um, all along different depths of the seamount. So that's what we're trying to do today. So we selected a dive track that could accomplish that goal. Um, we usually target uh, features like ridges uh, because these are areas of current acceleration where we're more likely to see communities of corals and sponges, which is one of the things that we're interested in seeing. Um, areas that might be in valleys will be more sedimented so sort of like at the beginning of our dive today we were in a little bit of a valley we saw more sediment there and now that we are more on a ridge like feature we're seeing more hard substrate so we usually target those types of ridge features the uh, ridge features are also uh, a nice safe place for the rov to operate because there isn't any hard walls on either side of the rov for so for Operation safety, uh, selecting a dive where the ROV uh, in, can be easily uh, recovered in case of emergency uh, is Hello, also Army. one of the things that we like to keep in mind when planning our dive plan. We are seeing another polychaete worm, another swimmer. So we've been seeing this is a very wormy dive as well as a fishy dive. Do you want to do a reset? Whoop, 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 whoop. Okay. I'll hang out here for a minute. What's that goo falling down? Uh, it is goo. Good, good oh, okay. idea. Thanks. <laughs> Corley question: What metals readily precipitate on oceanic rocks? Are there some metals that their precipitation rates are slower than their mass transfer out of the sediment? Here we go. Thanks. That sounds like a question from a chemist. Um, <laughs> that's really interesting. I don't know. I am not a, uh, I don't study reactions like that, unfortunately. I have a friend, though, who's yeah. a chemical engineer who studies, uh, like, the rate of reactions. He's, like, a chemical kineticist, kinematicist, something like that. Are we going to do phone a friend? Is this phone a friend hour? Uh, he doesn't study, uh, he doesn't study 
metals. He studies plastics. Oh, like darn. Glass and stuff. That is important stuff, though. It is. Thank you for studying that plastic man. Yeah, he burns plastic. All right. <laughs> you do what you got to well, do. Let's take a look at this star. Yeah, I don't think we've one? seen Go one ahead. of these yet. So this is actually a, a crinoid. So this is one of those unstocked crinoids or feather stars. And this one is a pentametrocrinoidy. What's the thing in the middle of his middle? Oh, uh, you mean right here? Yeah. That's its anus. Okay. Learning so much about crinoids. Yep. Thank you. So their mouths are on the bottom and their butts are on the top. Hmm. So pentametrocrinus. So this question is saying uh, it's hard to pin down coral age, but we talk about them being very, very old. Uh, what do we think are their longest lived associates? Longest lived associates, um, we have no idea. Uh, generally, uh, the associates probably live shorter lives than the corals. And I would make that uh, estimation based on how long these animals live in shallow water environments. But in comparison to their shallow water cousins, Associates like these feather stars, uh, sea stars, snake stars, um, likely live a bit longer than they would in, say, a shallow reef uh, ecosystem. But we don't know exactly how long some of these animals live because it's really hard to study them and uh, you'd have to keep visiting the same animal and because they are mobile, it would be not an easy feat to, to, to watch them over time. Got so, yeah, we don't really know. Uh, what's this on the rock over here? Let's find out. Is it one of those sea snails that makes the path? It might be one of those sea snails. I just sort of saw like a little bit of like a bluish, glowish, okay. glowyish in, tint. Aaron's going for the ID points. Let's see. Oh yeah, she's right. She's on it. Yeah. Two points. What is it? It's a slit snail. Ah, it looks very snail-like. Mm-hmm. Wow. So we did make a collection of one of these. Cool. And these are the culprits of making those little snail trails all over the rocks. So you can see his little trail. Oh, that's not that's the circle, not the draw. Probably <laughs> That is a large circle. <laughs> I, I just drew a big S on the screen and it made oh. a very large <laughs> circle. <laughs> Let me highlight the entire screen for you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right about there. Uh, we've got a parent and four-year-old in the chat. Hello. Uh, little one wants to know what's the coolest thing the robot has found. Oh, we get that question a lot. Have you found anything cool with the robot, Trevor? Well, or, uh, on this dive, we brothers. saw a peanut worm. What is that, you may ask? It's a squishy little animal that buries itself in dirt and has a really long proboscis. And it sweeps around and tries to eat by sweeping into an animal as, it, as another animal cruises by. And then we kind of startled it, and it retracted right back into the dirt pile. That was pretty cool. That was really cool. Agreed. Identification question. How can you tell that crinoid apart from a brisingid? A crinoid and a brisingid? I'm reading the chat. Okay. <laughs> I said a crinoid apart from a brisingid. Oh, because a crinoid? Is that what I meant to say? Yes. Yes. Crinoid. A crinoid and a brisingid. Um What did I say crinoid? Oh yeah, I just mixed two things together. Yeah, you Sorry. were thinking about corals. I was crinoid, like, wait, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um 
crinoids, our feather stars, the best way to identify them is they have these little legs um, called cirri that they use to attach to coral, sponges, rocks, and they have the long arms that are very feather-like. Uh, Brasingids are sea stars, so they are going to be uh, a bit bulkier, uh, and they have spines that are have like little sticky balls at the ends. Um, they they don't look as soft as say a crinoid. Uh, Brasingids usually lift their arms uh, up into the water column in a feeding posture, uh, and crinoids can sometimes use that posture too. Crinoids can also undulate their arms. So this is an example um, of a Brasingid sea star. This one's not in the feeding posture. But you can see Zoom that in on the it is a little more robust looking than the crinoid we were just looking it is at. Robust. Look at how robust it is. Yeah. They usually are the sort of pinkish orange color, but you can see some that are, are white color. Is that a trick of the light, or is one of its uh, little arms a little shorter there? Yeah, it looks like someone might have snacked on an arm or two, and the arm is, is growing back. I got a star question. How All do you right. tell the difference between a Brasingid and a Brittle Star if they both have five legs? Um, so the Brittle Stars are usually a bit more snaky looking. Snaky? Um, yeah, like they can manipulate their arms and, and move them Zoom in, uh, please. and articulate them a bit more than a Brasingid. Um, Brasingids are also considerably larger that one's in really general. Wee. Yeah, that's the same little Thanks. tiny uh, porcelanid, uh, por por porcelain asterid sea star that we collected earlier. But most of uh, my IDs come from just looking at these animals over and over again. So I can try to tell you uh, verbally what the characters are, but you've probably noticed that a lot of the animals have similar body forms. They might have, you know, that pentaradial symmetry. Um, and you're like, well, how does she know the difference? And if you keep looking at these things, they'll start to form patterns in your mind of what each one of these animals looks like. And after some time, it'll, it'll be really obvious of which ones are which. Uh, a fun game to play if you are really interested in trying to ID some of these animals is to use the animal identification guide. What's that? The animal identification guide is arranged taxonomically. So that means that they are broken down into uh, groups based on what type of animal they are. So brasingids, uh, crinoids, uh, they are econoderms, so that's the phylum econodermata. That's that first step. And some of the um, breakdowns in the animal guide have some common names. We try to use common names when possible, but some animals don't. animal groups don't have common names. And then that'll bring you to a gallery, which will show you a bunch of pictures. And you can look at the pictures and look at what you're seeing on your screen. And so test yourself of... These rocks I think are really this cool. is a crinoid and go to the crinoid gallery, see what it is. See if you can find a picture that matches what you're seeing. And you'll probably find that after t a little bit of time practicing and going through galleries, you'll be able to find uh, a matching mm -hmm. image quite easily. Also, I agree, Trevor, these rocks are really cool. Can you tell us about them? Yeah. They're rocks. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. See, I was going. I was waiting to see if her response to you asking that question was going to be different than when I asked her that question. But I'm glad that you like, you know, you're very uh, democratic about your answer. <laughs> they're, they're rocks. <laughs> are they? Are they what? I, I don't have any idea. How do they? Why are they so different than the other ones? Yeah. Why are they so flat? And they're so yeah, flat and blocky, blocky and not all crusty. It might be because uh, it's pro it's because of the way the basalt deposited, and then the way the crust formed over the basalt, and then 
how the sediment is reacting to the different morphologies of the two. So we see like a lot of kind of the encrusted ones look pretty rounded and kind of blobby. But that one, ha that one has some really sharp corners. What's the story there? Yeah, I'm also a little bit confused about that too. Well, to me, I don't know, I'm not a geologist, so tell me if I'm wrong, but it looks like this might have been a sheet flow. So it, when lava flows really fast, uh, it doesn't form those pillows that we, we saw in the last dive, and it forms these sort of flat sheets. And then maybe over time with stress, you get some fracturing, and that's why we're seeing that the more angular rocks. Yeah. Whereas uh, pillows will fracture in a very specific sort of radial way. And that's my geology. Can you get a sheet flow underwater? Like, doesn't it cool too fast to allow it to? If there's enough volume, uh, it, the lava can flow in sheets. Even underwater? Even underwater. That was what I was told. Excellent remembering. Mm -hmm. How amazing would it be to see that in action? Oh my gosh, ROV? it would be crazy. Mm -hmm. It would be really yeah. hot. I don't know if the ROV would like that. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we streamed live to shore. Sacrificial ROV. Oh man, that that footage would be. It would be worth it. Worth it, yeah. Kind of like when they I'm, I'm on Team on, like, Trevor on this one. That would be worth it <laughs> for sure. I mean, I'd, I'd chip in ten bucks for that ROV. <laughs> NASA sends probes into the sun. Yeah, I was just saying that it's like uh, when they send things to land on Venus and they just kind of like, well, there it goes. I think it was today, actually, that the first ever human-created object hit the sun. Nice. How'd yeah. it go? Do you know? No, I read the headline like a schmuck. <laughs> Did not read the article. That's how I get my news. Yeah. <laughs> Scroll through the headlines. Uh, do we have any idea how old these stars might be by sight? Or if not if we collected a sample how would you date a star star uh sea star how old oh. sorry oh i'm sorry i just switched from space to yeah, yeah i'm okay. at a sea star okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like, i don't know i don't know ringer. about space stars <laughs> click the sample of this sun uh, what? I, i'm sure there's a way to that people understand how old um, space stars are um, but that's not my area of expertise uh sea stars um, that might be challenging. Uh, it's hard fish. to date living organisms. Oh yeah, nice fish. Can you zoom on the fish, please? Palosaur? Nope, oh, it's a cuscule. That's what I meant to say. So this one might be Lucichorus. All We've right. seen like a wide diversity of cuscules. On this dive, like uh, little saw mask. Bazazetus, Typhlonus natus. Nasus. Go ahead, and this one too. Oh, this one might be a Bazazetus. Oh, he's very dark against yep. a very light background. Very dark, little tiny eye. Yeah, that's a Bazazetus. All right, thanks. Uh, Lucichorus, Acanthonus armatus. So this this might be a dumb question, Megan, but we are seeing a lot of shrimp. Would that be one of the reasons there's so many of these eel-like fish? Because we saw that one eating one earlier. Oh, like yeah. Like it's a high food density maybe, or a higher food, not, not high, but like a higher food density. Yeah, that could be a reason why we're seeing more fish here is uh, there are more crustaceans to eat. Uh, fish also seem to like these uh, flat areas uh, for foraging especially flat sandy areas or, or muddy areas. So we usually do see more fish in areas similar to this one. Are you going to explain? No, never mind. They're not going to explain. There we go. We have a couple guests coming into the control van soon. Oh. Yeah, but like well, before we got distracted by the fish, what I was saying about aging, living or organisms can be difficult, especially if they don't have 
hard parts that might be laid down in sort of a regular fashion, like the way corals will create their skeleton. Um, so aging living animals like sea stars or sponges uh, is quite difficult. And uh, before I continue on with questions, uh, continue to type your questions in the chat. We're just having very thorough and awesome explanations. So um, it's just, uh, you know, we're lagging behind on the chat a little bit, but we will try to answer your questions. So keep typing them in. Um, well, since I have one more comment, since people are really interested in figuring out how old things are. Yeah, yeah. Um, for fish, fish have uh, a little bone in their ear that we call an otolith. And if you uh, cut that, it leaves it has little rings and you can count the rings and that will tell you how old a fish is. So, so not only is it amazing that uh, fish ears have tree ring like structures, but now you have to answer before someone asks on the chat, fish have ears? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like in side of their head, they've got like sort of a little bone called an otolith. I believe huh? it looks for it works a little bit in the hearing. I don't know a lot about fish hearing, but yeah, I, they do react to sound, so fish right. can hear. Right. And I feel like in this type of environment where it's dark, you need to rely on other senses. Absolutely. So um, you're going to rely on your sensory um, senses along with you using your lateral line if you're a fish. Um, so any sort of sound vibrations. You're going to react to those things. And I'm just preempting chat before I, I... So I'll just ask the questions before they come. Um, you've said lateral line uh, quite a bit uh, during this dive because we've seen a lot of fish with uh, lateral lines. Um, what are they? So the lateral line uh, runs along the body of the fish. Oh, there's a polychelid. This is Homerian asper. It's a type of crustacean. So it has these sort of long in, arms that are folded up. Some people call this like a lobster, but it's not a lobster. But they are crustaceans. Nope. Oh, you were saying about the lateral lines? Yeah, so lateral lines. Um, they are... Uh, sensory and uh, so a fish will be able to sense vibrations in its environment movements in the water using the lateral line um, fish that like to swim in schools will use their lateral line to know where they are in space in relation to the other fish and that's how the fish all swim equal distance from each other without running into each other now we're entering a little nodule field We've seen these nodule fields on the other seamounts within this chain. Oh, can we zoom? I don't know if that's a thing or not. Go ahead and zoom here. What were you looking at there? Oh, I thought I saw something, but it's just a little tube. Okay, come wide, please. So we're seeing a lot of critters up here, Megan. Or should I say down here? Down here, up on the sea mount. <laughs> yep. We're, so, we, are, we are down, but we are up higher than the surrounding seafloor. So. Um, are any of these animals dangerous to humans? Um, I don't think so. We would never cross paths, huh? Cause yeah. <laughs> uh, if they had any sort of, say, venom that might be dangerous to us, we, we wouldn't know. Uh, but there wouldn't really be a need for it down here for that sort of adaptation to uh, evolve. So I don't think anything at this depth 
would be something that would harm us in any way if we were to come in contact with it. Say if we collected it in the lab um, and touched it, it, it probably wouldn't be very dangerous to us. But we always take precautions in our lab to not contaminate our samples and also to keep ourselves safe by wearing gloves. I'd imagine some of these things are a little pokey. Yeah, there are a lot of things that are really pokey, uh, especially our glass sponges. So I feel like glass sponges are probably one of the more dangerous things we collect um, in that. Science, if I can interrupt, we're going to back the ship up. Um, okay. Dr. Rowler would like a sample a little bit down slope. Yeah, so the sponges are only dangerous in that they have these long spicules, which are basically shards of glass. Uh, and it's not, not comfortable to get that stuck in your hand. Uh, I have handled a sponge that poked me through my gloves that was really unpleasant. I was going to ask if that was a personal experience. Personal experience. Yeah. It, was, it was a demo sponge um, called Geo Geodia. And it just, it was very densely packed spicules. And um, it was kind of smelly too. So it, it was a very difficult sample to work with. So, asking for myself, not for the chat, um, glass sponges are made out of glass, but like as a structure, like are they hard, are they soft, like what do they feel like? So it depends on the family of the sponge that is in question. So some of them are very crunchy, they kind of break like chips. Um, like we'd expect from glass, kind yeah. of. Yeah, so especially some of the thin ones like conolasma, very thin. Um, and chip-like. Uh, some of them are soft, uh, like the uh, euplectelid bases, so like the regadrella uh, that we're seeing. Those are actually pretty soft. And then some can be very dense. Hey, confirming we got the, the on the forward box, the left box is open still? Yes, okay. I okay, was just thanks. about to ask. Yeah, can you put it in uh, the left forward box? Left forward, thanks. Just had to sort some things out in the back row here. Uh, we do have some uh, ROV questions, but our pilots are a little busy right now, so we'll come back to those later. Uh, you can put it in whichever one you want. Video, can you come super double extra wide? Thank you. Every bit's helping now. What sample number are we on? That was zero eight zero. Zero eight zero. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, has anyone documented the ocean floor on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? I what? This question says, has anyone documented the ocean floor under the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? I so, uh, I, the Great Pacific. I mean, it's a very large area. Yeah, it's so a yes. really large area. Yep. Um, some parts of that area of the ocean have uh, been <laughs> documented. Sticky. Uh, so say like the, the musician seamounts might fall in that area. I was on a cruise up to the musician seamounts. Those are a chain of seamounts that are located um, almost parallel to the Northwest Hawaiian Island chain, just north. Uh, and there are some really amazing communities of deep sea corals and sponges up there. So that is is a location 
um, that might be considered underneath the Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, there have been some transit lines mapping that area. It's mostly abyssal plain in that area, so very flat, um, mud-covered area inside uh, on the bottom of the ocean. So um, some of that location has been mapped, but uh, not a lot of it has been explored. But very little of our ocean has been explored. And we've mainly been targeting areas like seamounts for exploration and also along our coastlines. Are you happy for me to zoom in a little, Trevor? So that uh, areas like no, canyons keep it super wide. And, uh, yeah. and the continental shelf have been explored. But we have so much work left to do to explore our oceans. I'm going to lump these questions together and hop around a little bit. Why is there not a lot of trash down there? I'm glad there isn't very much trash down here. I feel like there's a lot more trash down here than there should be. Absolutely. I um, mean, this is a place that no one's ever visited, ever, but yet see. there's trash here. Yep. Why? Uh, why? Actually, also, something to know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is um, it's not necessarily, I don't know if fair is the right word, but it's not necessarily fair to think of it as a garbage patch because um, a lot of it is microplastics, um, which is kind of a really big issue. So there's like, like primary microplastics, which is stuff that we used to have. Um, in like toothpaste and stuff, but then there's secondary microplastics, which is when you take something big with plastic and then you like erode it more and more. And yeah, it, it breaks, breaks up down, especially uh, in the sun, right? So UV light helps break down plastics into microplastics. Yeah. It's brittle. And also like ocean currents and just like knocking around on stuff. So. There's also that. So while you don't, you may not be saying like, "Oh, I see trash." Just, just know that there's <laughs> tiny microplastic particles probably all throughout this this column. Yeah, and we have found microplastics in the stomachs of animals living in the deepest areas of the ocean. Um, what are you thinking? Even in the Marianas Trench. So I, I believe it was a, an amphipod that was collected on an expedition down to the depths of the Marianas Trench. And it was a new species to science. It was described and it had microplastics in its stomach. Um, and that its name reflected that phenomenon. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a sad thing that there are plastics and animals are eating them even this deep in the ocean. Next question is, have we ever run across human remains? Uh, bones don't last great on the seafloor, correct? No, Not there down. are animals that uh, do consume bones, so uh, you don't usually see uh, remains from long periods of time. Um, I mean, there is a possibility to find human remains if we were exploring a wreck, uh, but it's not something that is very common. And in the rate at which um, large food things like whale falls gets consumed is, is really pretty quick yeah, in terms that? of deep Did sea time scales. So, uh, yeah, you know, you can you can return back to say a whale fall uh, every year and see large changes in in the fall and how all the animals that are at that location are consuming everything that's there so it is food is food is one of those things down here that is a limiting factor and when you find it it is best to take advantage of it and a lot of animals are very well adapt adapted to consuming specific things like bones so um, there's also uh, worms that are in the deep sea that are ad adapted to consuming things like wood and you wouldn't necessarily Aaron, to up? find wood this deep, but we did pick up a piece of wood on one of our previous dives. I believe it was our second dive, our expedition, and uh, it had some of these shipworms on it, and they actively consume wood. So that might be a reason why we don't find 
a lot of wooden shipwrecks because some of that has been consumed as well. That makes sense. Come on, you. Oh, let's it's see. It's just things like plastic. There aren't any animals that actively consume that. Well, they don't, well, they don't oh, get yeah. nutrition from it. Right. <laughs> but plastic is not a nutrition, nutrient-rich thing that will be good for any animal. Right, no problem. Yeah, it's more toxic-rich. Mm -hmm. Toxic rich, nice. Yeah. Um, uh, we also do have protocol for those types of things as well. If if we were to find something like that. Right. The the video team does and stuff. So. It's just unlikely that we would. It's very unlikely, but they like the team does talk about that kind of stuff and what to do in in the case of something like that. That's good to know. Right, are similar morphologies due to common ancestry or convergent evolution? Um, I think both. Uh, so we do see very similar morphologies across a number of different um, non-genetically related groups uh, because that morphology is advantageous to the job that uh, they're trying to do. So the ecological niche they're trying to fill. Uh, but again, we can see morphologies that are similar within groups that are uh, genetically related. So yes, you are gonna see convergent evolution, uh, make, uh, having uh, these morphologies arise in different ways. Awesome. Um, oh, this comment just says that it's very reassuring when they hear a scientist say, I don't know, because, you know, it means that you have things to learn. And, like, yeah, oh, I have so much to learn. Um, it's, it's hard to, you can't know everything, and definitely uh, every dive I learn something new, I see something new. Um, I love learning from all my coworkers out here. Uh, everybody has their own little niche, so I've been learning a lot about rocks from corally and, and ferromanganese crusts mm -hmm. that I didn't know. And every time I go and I dive, I pick up this information, and, and that's why I know so many different things. So you're like, oh, wow, this biologist knows things about ROVs. She knows things about rocks. Well, I didn't actually study these things. I've, I've learned them from other people, and uh, now I'm sharing them with you. Yeah. Also, the whole reason why we do science is because there's so much stuff we don't know. We're trying to figure out, you know, about our world. Yeah, if we knew everything, there'd okay. be no Good. point yeah, to be there'd here. Yeah, there'd be no point to exploring, because we would know it. That wouldn't be any fun. No. I think there was a Futurama episode. Where they knew everything? Everyone Futurama. knew everything? Yeah. There was, there was nothing left to learn, and uh, it was sad. Oh, that is sad. There was there was nothing left. Uh, my advisor's collaborator. I'm uh, there. She has like a reading group at the Smithsonian, um, and I remember her saying um, something that she kind of strives for is for her work, for people to build on her work and to prove her work like wrong almost because mm -hmm. like find something new out about it and prove it wrong because like that's like when you know like you're doing good science because people are building off of it. People are like choosing to like, you know, jump off, use that as a starting point and go forward. Yeah. It's fun to do work that excites people and encourages more work. And yeah. that's why every paper I read, there's that last section where they say, this sure. is the next step. Yeah. Yeah. The, like, you know, the next thing we want to do is this or, here are our conclusions. This is what we think would be a really interesting study. Beautiful. Because we're never that? really done. Yeah. Oh yeah, the sunset looks gorgeous tonight. Thanks for wow, the view, Erin. Yeah. We can't see the outside for ourselves since we are in the control van, but we can spy on it using our cameras. 
I've been complaining to people that we haven't been able to see the sunsets because of our watches, and someone said they look better on camera. No. <laughs> they actually <It's> the do. Cameras. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will often be in the, the data lab, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, look at that, and then it's I go magical, outside. magical, yeah. And, and then, then I'm like, oh, so disappointed. <laughs> 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 it's so just normal. Reality sucks. <laughs> The stars are pretty awesome, though. Yeah, are you able to see some? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I finally got my stars. Yay! There's going to be planets. some good stars tonight. Did you download the app that I told you to? I did. It's like a little bit off. Oh. But and like it's fine. But like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Um, there's uh, mostly things that I am not used to identifying, so it's really awesome. Yeah, it's probably just because the the GPS is having a hard time locating you in no. this very yeah, weird part true. of the ocean. <laughs> no, it's only off by like. <laughs> Just like a hint, so like the moon's supposed to be here, and like it's a little bit over there. Um, but yeah, it's it's cool being in another uh, in another latitude, seeing what's around. Yeah, I'm like, what latitude are we at right now? I literally don't even know. It's so bad. Well, it's probably just going off your last known position, which was Honolulu. Yeah. Twenty one. Oh yeah. my gosh, we're so south what i'm used to we are so south you are right we're not super south but we're pretty south we're not the most south but we're pretty south yeah <laughs> um this is a holdover from the last shift uh is it a bathysaurus bathysaur bath um did we see a bathysaurus i don't know but the did question we, is yeah. <laughs> did, did we they... see a, a white fish that was sitting on the ground I think it was from the last watch, not from our last watch. Oh, okay. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, we didn't see it because I, I would have <laughs> screamed at it because I like them. The question is, uh, do they use, is it buccal or buccal pumping? Um, probably. Not, what, like frogs do? Yeah. But uh, they are ambush predators, uh, the, the bathysaurus, and so they, they'll just uh, sit on the bottom very, very still and then... They'll wait for something to come by and make their move. Uh, working on it. Again, in the chat, uh, please keep sending us your questions. We are very far behind, but because we love talking about all of these things, we're giving you thorough explanations. So hang in there with us. We'll talk about all the stuff. Uh. I don't know if we were on the dive. It says at one point we found a star called the Evil Something, but they can't find it on the Googles. The Chris Kelly was talking about that. The okay. Evil Something. Yeah. It, what was the starfish that Chris Kelly kept calling the? He kept saying Evil Star. Oh, is, is it one of the ones that eats the corals? Yeah, it's oh. one of the ones that eats the corals. Um, probably Hypasteria. So it wasn't actually the name wasn't. It's evil its scientific star, it just... name had something that sounded kind sounded of like evil. evil. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now well, let me see if I can find it. All right. Also, I asked Adam about what he thinks about these rock formations, and he says yes, you can have shape flows underwater. However, he thinks that it's possible that this could just be crust. 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 And that was one of the comments that we're eventually getting to. Could this just be a bunch of crust? Like, what's just crust? What does that mean? It's just like the ferromanganese crust. Like, it oh, just like just overgrowthed, layer. like oh. the basalt underneath it. So, Very what cool. made it uh, fracture like this? Yeah, I I don't know. I have no idea what. Like, there's so how much we know about ferromanganese crust formation is so little. That well, don't I don't even know some? if it fractured. I wonder if it just formed that way. Do you want a piece? <laughs> I want a piece. I don't know what okay. I'm going to do with it. But <laughs> we offered her a piece at the very beginning, and Aaron, she said, well, not Aaron good. wants a piece. We should get a piece. You should not get a piece Wait, for me. I'm I wanted a piece. It. Wait, Aaron gets a piece, and I don't get a piece. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron does not need a piece. Aaron is going to go to sleep and not touch any rocks, though. So <laughs> we'll only get rocks Ooh. you want. Oh, look at That's that. A baby How can you piece. say no to something like that? Okay, see... Can you zoom in on that? That's that is yeah, super that's cool like looking. Properly, yeah. Zoom in, please, on this dust oh. cloud.
I don't Give know. me a Looking second. At these stars, <laughs> I don't see anyone that sounds evil. Evil Osoma? So evil Soma? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah evil, it was. Evil, okay. evil Plosoma? Yeah, yeah that that's was it. it. Oh, okay. Okay, because it sounds like evil Plosoma. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. It's so that's Evo. Ferromanganese crust. The brown stuff isn't ferromanganese crust. That's something else. It looks like mud. Yeah, it looks like mud, but that's probably why it's so crumbly. So how, is that how squishy is it? Should we try to squish it? Yeah, yeah. we should try to squish it. 100%. <laughs> Come wide, please. Yep. So would you call that a science bonk? <laughs> yeah, it's a bonk for science. Yeah. It's a um, hardness a test. A yeah. squish for science. Oh, oh yeah. uh. <laughs> <laughs> very squishy. <laughs> Trevor, you just went in for that. <laughs> Were you waiting just days to do that? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Oh my Can we keep it? Can we keep it? Can we? Can we? <laughs> oh, this is going to crumble into oh dust. My God. Wow. Okay, I think wow. we probably the, should take a little piece of this. Look at the oh, wafer that's, center. That's really weird. I yeah. Think Bob would be sad if we did it. It's like dark chocolate. With peanut butter center? Exactly yeah, totally. what I was thinking. <laughs> I could totally go for that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to take a oh, piece Oh, you this. guys, we have gotten the best achievement ever. We got oh, come on, the four-year-old so to stop watching Paw Patrol because this fascinated him. Oh, this, oh we're yeah. better than Paw Patrol? We are better yes. than Paw Patrol. Yeah, we are. So is this small enough? Yeah, that's great. Chance. Okay, that's going to go in the starboard side. Okay. 100% chance. Thanks for the confidence boost. Starboard e is open. Can I get the manip on bubble, please? Can't say. Can you switch my cameras around, please? The uh, yeah, Trader Joe's it? makes these like dark chocolate um, peanut butter cups. I cannot believe how little I can see right now. Now I have a craving for them. Uh, go ahead. So this is gonna go in. F Ooh, well, let's see. Hmm. Am I gonna die? No, I'm not gonna die. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can this hold the ship. I forgot. No, Bridge and hold position. More fun. Um. Start yeah, this might fit in one of the small boxes. I'll try that first. Okay, if you can, E and F are both open. Kay. And it's Let's pretty go. flat, so we could put another it. rock on. Mm. Yeah, totally. I'll try okay. a small box yeah, first. Yeah, maybe a small box, actually. And then if not... That's a big rock, yo. Oh, that is a large... <laughs> that's a really big rock. Yeah, that's going to go in Foxtrot. How about... That F? Is it too big? <laughs> you could just smash it. <laughs> Come well, on. when you close the drawer, it'll probably just like crush again. Hmm. Well, I'm worried that, that it'll like crumble. It'll all crumble though. Yeah, totally. My mom is listening in. Hi, mom. She's gonna get me some of those peanut butter cups. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Mom. Is that okay? Happy with what we're what we're at now? Yeah, that works. Okay, sounds good. It's the best, it. Megan's mom. That was zero eight one. Roger zero eight one. Thank you. Uh, yeah. We are apparently the favorite watch of Fire Station Twenty Five in Cobb County, Georgia. Oh wow! Ooh. Victory flip. <laughs> All right. Thank you for all you do, your service, putting out fires. You want to stomp on it a little more or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, for well, science or for fun? I'll do it for science. <laughs> the next person that comes to survey this area is going to be like, oh my. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, what if a like mass extinction event happens <laughs> for humans and then like the next like really intelligent species is like, Wait, <laughs> why did it do this? <laughs> I like how that will be their concern, is this small this patch. One, <laughs> this one, this one patch. Stone, yeah. <laughs> what what happened guys? to the human race? Oh, look at this rock that's been flipped. <laughs> cool. And sometimes I think about that uh, when we leave, like, big yeah. little, you know, ROV-sized uh, footprints in the sediment. And if you're down on the Bizzle Plains, you know that... Uh, Sediment right, accumulation happens very slowly, so that footprint's going to stick around for a while. I've always wanted to get a like a Nautilus compass rose shaped stamp for the bottom oh, of her. Oh yeah, I think that'd be so cool. That would be really cool. I can't take credit for that idea. I don't remember who thought of that, but I think it's a really good one. Just like Herc was here. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> 
corally question. Oh, wait, first bio question. Have you seen any corals? Yeah. Yeah, we saw some corals. Corals. This place is super, like, fishy and wormy, but I've seen some corals. Yes, yeah, some corals here and there. Um, the corals probably don't like this substrate, seeing as it's uh, not uh, real speak rock. Speak of the coral. Wait, is this a coral? No, it's not a coral. This what? is a stalk crinoid, a oh, proisocrinus. No. I was wrong. Can you zoom in on the crinoid? I'm going to get the bottom yep. first, then I'll move up. Go ahead. Yeah. Are we getting real close? Yeah. Okay. Oh, just kidding. Wait, I'm hold on. A, I'm going to do a poor job of staying still. I'm going to move way too fast, and then it'll be gone. <laughs> uh, that was a... Nice. That was, and that was something. That was not. <laughs> I should have. I should have held held it in the zoom a bit. That was my enthusiasm. Now for the corally question. The corally question, not the coral e question. Are grainy sandy sediments uh, more common than finer muddy sediments down here? I mm, I don't. No, I think it depends on the depositional environment. It definitely seems like this stuff seems more grainy and sandy. But I'm sure, like, in abyssal plains and stuff, it's more muddy. Uh, by the way, I just realized we're getting close to our next uh, Rock and Niskin sample area. You've got to be kidding me. This is my lucky day. <laughs> What's the depth? What's your target depth? Target depth is 3350. 3350, three, okay. Uh. Look at these horizontal striations or whatever you want to call them, lines of some flavor. See them in Argus view. Oh, yeah, in Argus view, they look crazy. Yeah. I bet that's where, you know, this sort of sheet manganese crust thing has fractured and the sediments gathering there it could be fractured but again like it could also be the way the crust is forming mm, yeah there because okay i think i said this before maybe i didn't say it in a very very well but there, like when minerals grow there's like a way that they grow that makes the most sense energetically and so maybe it made the most sense energetically for them to grow this way what kind of energy oh god <laughs> rock, like, energy. <laughs> rock energy it's like chemistry i'm like not very good at i need a material science engineer to come help me oh Phone a friend. Yeah, it's phone a friend hour. Do it. We will every, wait. Every hour is phone a friend hour, I think. No shame in admitting you don't know something. Absolutely. We love phone a friend hour. Um, Megan, are you hoping to find genetic differences between the same species on different seamounts? That would be something really interesting to study. Um, so there probably is some sort of connectivity genetically between these seamounts. We have definitely been seeing a uh, community sort of connectivity. We're seeing a lot of the same patterns of organisms at the same depths as we make our way from um, lower down on the seamount to the summit. Yeah. But uh, we have not been systematically collecting um, the same coral species on each dive. And that would be necessarily to compare the genetics. But if someone were to be interested in doing that type of study, uh, we would definitely uh, consider con collecting the species of interest. So if you're a scientist out there and you are actively doing um, connectivity studies or looking at genetics across seamounts, um, you can let us know and, and put a request in collections all right we're at the target depth now within a meter so let me know when you see a rock that you want how about this one come yeah up to I was lasers gonna say now. how about that one deal now do you think that's a rocky rock or a like a mud rock looks I like a crusty, rock. A, really crusty rock. a rocky rock yeah let's do a crush test crush test because uh. basalt doesn't crush <laughs> does it have to be a, over a basalt core is that the requirement no, it doesn't have to be. 
So crush test first? Yeah, we could do a crush test. Okay, well, slightly stiffer than the last one. Want to try something? Yeah. Are you going to throw it on something? Sure. <laughs> oh. Oh. That works. Zoom in, please, before the cloud gets here. It's a much more manageable size now. But it is also that... That mud, mud stuff. stuff. Peanut, peanut butter, butter rock, yeah. yeah. Peanut butter rock. Well, what do you, would you like keep or not keep? Yeah, we can keep it. Okay, great. This will fit in a small box. I say with no evidence to back that claim up. I bet that all the rock around here is is this and not real rock rock. Rock rock. Okay, go ahead. And box out, please. Oh no. Uh there's a sorry, there's a rock and D. Can you put oh. it in C? <laughs> <laughs> like why doesn't that fit? I thought it might fit. Charlie? Charlie. Okay. Okay. Sample taken. Yay. And then I'm gonna fly away before I put this away because I can't see anything. Well I could do it from Argus, that's what I could do. Uh, the Niskin. Um, you want it to be full of all this muck? Maybe we can we wait for it to settle a little bit? Sure, I could move it like two meters ahead. Your call. That works. Okay, let's do that. Oop. While we're flying away from the cloud, uh, what is the worst smelling sample you have collected? Um, normally the samples that we collect don't smell upon recovery. I've collected a stink worm. Oh, that's, that sounds <laughs> smelly. It was very stinky. But yeah, so, so most of them aren't naturally stinky, uh, but they will stink if we ha need to oh, uh, so let them dry right out. There. So I Sorry, think uh, probably our smelliest okay. collection is going to be that piece of dead sponge that we collected. I, um, Tell you what, I'm gonna lateral to port so I see keep the same depth for really? you. That'd be great. Yeah. It's gonna be Chris. pretty smelly. What kind of smell are we working with here? Like, sort of. It's beachy yikes. kind of smell. I don't know. It's not um, a deep sea fish, but there's a fish that smells identical to a cucumber. It smells like a cucumber. Yeah, it smells identical to a cucumber. Oh, that's weird. I don't remember what it's called. It's quite small. It's a few inches long. They're in Alaska. Can I get the Niskin can, please? Do we know what it okay, tastes like? Okay, Niskins one through five are Does open. it taste no, like uh, cucumber? I've camera. never eaten it. I've just smelled it. <laughs> Switch my starboard box. And it, it's it's so Niskin. surprising. It smells can like fresh cucumber. Can you do Niskin cucumber. five? Niskin five, sure. That's a weird thing to smell like when you're not a cucumber. Oh, swing and a miss. If we uh, ever collected oh, whalebone, that would be probably the smelliest sample. Niskin 5. Great. That was sample 083. Okay. Got some ROV questions whenever you guys are ready. I'm ready for ship move when you are. Uh, okay. I'm ready for an ROV question. All right. Have you ever brought back uh, a creature on top of the one uh, one of the ROVs that was unintentional? Oh, big time. A bonus sample. Yep. Yep, definitely have. They uh, just kind of find their way into the vehicle sometimes. Um, are there any major tools or features that you wish you had on the ROVs? Hydraulic rock splitter. 
that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, we've tried crowbar a, probably a dozen times, and it does not work. Crowbar is not a helpful tool, even.